Well, please join me by turning to the book of 1 Samuel, the book of 1 Samuel chapter 16. 1 Samuel chapter 16. Just a moment, I will begin reading in verses 14 through 23 as we continue our verse-by-verse study through 1 Samuel. Trust that you had a good weekend and a good holiday, Thanksgiving. Everybody, everybody doing okay? Everybody awake this morning? And, you know, I, I, I was thinking there's a lot that I've been preparing this week, but I, I just want to, uh, I'm, I'm really going to attempt to try to keep this very simple. Um, this, is, this is an interesting passage that we're dealing with. And so um, I, I think that as simple as we can keep it, uh, the better off that we will be. Um, that being said, I, I, um, I want to start this morning by asking a question I think I know the answer to, and that is, uh, uh, have you heard the expression that everything happens for a reason? Uh, obviously, we've heard that expression. We hear that a lot. Uh, more times than not, it, we hear that expression that everything happens for a reason in the, in the context of uh, oftentimes with grief, we hear of uh, someone that died suddenly or uh, something that is uh, tragic, unforeseen, or, or something that uh, is an unexpected outcome. Uh, a young person dies and uh, someone will say, well, you know, everything happens for a reason. And, and it's really an expression uh, that's given in an attempt to offer some kind of meaning uh, and significance to that person's life. Uh, we want our life to, to count. Uh, we want to understand that um, uh, there's a reason why things happen. And, and that comes from a place, not always from a place of biblical faith, although uh, we understand that in Scripture. A lot of times it's couched in the language of Eastern religion, uh, karma or, or fate. Um, but the Scriptures do teach uh, that uh, things just don't happen, that there is purpose, there is reason. In fact, uh, there, we can understand that it is uh, everything happens in accordance with God's holy, wise, and infinitely good purposes. As Paul would say in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 11, that everything happens according to God's purpose, who works all things after the counsel of His will. I find great encouragement in those kind of verses. Uh, Romans 8.28 is one that we often quote about God working all things together for those whom he loves and for those who are called according to his purpose. I, I find great encouragement in those kind of verses because it reminds me that our God is, is sovereign, that he's in control. Uh, a lot of times we, we, we know that. We're not always... Um, we're not always aware or, or keen about that. Um, in, in fact, a lot of times we're not even, uh, we, we don't know at the very time what God is doing. I was reminded of this, I don't know that I've ever shared this story, but I was reminded when, uh, after I got out of the army, I uh, had been at home for a little while, and I, we were living with my in-laws when we first moved back, and, uh, and I had uh, applied, uh, this is before I come to faith in Christ, I, I had applied for a job as a, as a driver for a beer company. And I, and I went and I, I did the interview and um, thought everything went really well, and they said, we will call you. Well, I, they never called, I never heard from them, and um, it wasn't till almost 20 years later, and I'd been saved some seven years, that my mother-in-law told me, oh, by the way, they did call some 20 years ago, and you did get the job. But she said, I, I knew it was not God's plan for you to work for a beer company, and so I just never passed the message along to you. You know, you, you, you never know what God is doing in your life. And certainly, I can look back on that, and I can see where God put me on a different path. I was on a different trajectory. Had I gone to work with that company, 
I, I don't know where I would have ended up. But we can't always see those things that God is doing in our own life. We, we don't always recognize that. But I want to encourage you today just to be, be mindful that God is at work. And, and be mindful that uh, even though uh, you don't always see it, uh, God is always at work. Uh, that's very clear in the passage that is before us today. In the passage that we're going to, to read today, uh, we see God at work. It's easy to see as we look at these heroes of the faith like David and we uh, see others uh, uh, throughout the, the pages of Scripture, it's easy to see the hand of God in their lives. And, and it's encouraging for us to trace that because it reminds us that He's not only in, involved in their life, but He's involved in our life as well. Uh, God is uh, not like the... Uh, uh, the false theology, the, the, the God of the, of the deist who, who says that uh, God just essentially created everything and set everything in motion, but then takes his hands off of it. No, our God is intricately involved in the affairs of men. God is, uh, is, is, is at work in our life. He is at work in the affairs of men. You know, sometimes we look at what's going on and the question is posed, where is God at in the midst of what's happening in our culture? He is on His throne. And there's nothing that is happening that is apart from His purpose and His plan. Now, be encouraged uh, that God is on His throne. And be encouraged by the passage that we're going to look at today, uh, that God is working in the lives of his people, and even others to accomplish his purpose. Let's look at verse number 14. Uh, we looked last time at the first 13 verses of chapter 16, but I want to look beginning in verse number 14. And let's read this account. It says, Now the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and an evil spirit from the Lord terrorized him. Saul's servants then said to him, Behold, now an evil spirit from God is terrorizing you. Let our Lord now command your servants who are before you. Let them seek a man who is a skillful player on the harp. And it shall come about when the evil spirit from God is on you that he shall play the harp with his hand. And you will be well. So Saul said to his servants, Provide for me now a man who can play well and bring him to me. Then one of the young men said, Behold, I have seen a son of Jesse the Bethlehemite, Bethlehemite, who is a skillful musician, a mighty man of valor, a warrior, one prudent in speech, and a handsome man, and the Lord is with him. So Saul sent messengers to Jesse and said, Send me your son David who was with the flock. And Jesse took a donkey loaded with bread and a jug of wine and a young goat and sent them to Saul by David his son. Then David came to Saul and attended him. And Saul loved him greatly. And he became his armor bearer. Saul sent to Jesse saying, Let David now stand before me, for he has found favor in my sight. So it came about whenever the evil spirit from God came to Saul, David would take the harp and play it with his hand. And Saul would be refreshed and be well, and the evil spirit would depart from him. And this is the word of our Lord. So let's pray together. Father in heaven, uh, we ask that through your Holy Spirit that you might pour out upon us wisdom and understanding that through the teaching of this passage, that our hope and our trust in you would be renewed and with faith. Receive your word in humility and with faith. This we ask through Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, in looking at this passage where it fits in the context, uh, we noticed last week in those first 13 verses that David was anointed uh, by the Spirit. Samuel had been sent 
to anoint David. Uh, David is uh, God's chosen instrument that he will be the next king. Uh, You'll recall that looking back earlier, we saw that Saul had been rejected by the Lord. He had been disobedient to the Lord. And so God had chosen David as his replacement. There's some irony that takes place in uh, the first 13 verses and what we're looking at today that's really worth noting. And and that is is that as as you consider this, uh, the irony is is that uh, uh, God's choice, Yahweh's choice, is David. And Saul's choice would be David as well in this second half. It's also worth noting that uh, Saul, who has been rejected by the Lord, is now seeking relief from how this is playing out and anointed by the Lord. It, it's real interesting how this is playing out, and you got to think that at the time that all of this is playing out, that nobody saw it. Uh, but after it's over with, uh, you, you got to know that there's somebody that said, man, you know, can, do, do you see how this happened and how the Lord's hand was in this? How God brought David to be a part of Saul's court. We can see it clearly now. At the time, we could not see it, but now we can see it. Everything happens for a reason. God is at work intricately involved in the affairs of man. So the passage that is before us today has to do with the anointing of uh, what has to do with the departure of the Spirit from Saul. That is, we saw earlier that Saul had been anointed by the Lord, but now the Spirit has departed from Saul. He's fallen out of favor favor with the Lord. And, And as a consequence of that, then we see that there is this evil spirit, and I know that's where you're already looking at, and your mind is already drawn there, this evil spirit that is says to be from the Lord is sent to terrorize Saul. And that's where I want to spend a good bit of our time this morning. And then the latter part of this is, uh, is Paul or Saul's response uh, to this evil spirit that's sent to terrorize him. He looks for a, a remedy, something to do. And so we'll walk through this this morning and just uh, very quickly just remind you about Saul's anointing Uh, As you look at verse number 14, it says, Now the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul. As we look at that and read that, we're reminded again that Saul was uh, anointed by the Lord. It says that this Spirit is of the Lord. So we're talking about the Holy Spirit of God that has anointed Saul. Remember that we saw that earlier. If you'll turn back to chapter 10 for a moment, we won't preach this whole sermon again, but just to remind us, about the Spirit of the Lord, that in chapter 10, beginning in uh, verse number 1, we see that Samuel uh, took the the flask of oil. He's supposed to go and anoint Saul as the king, and he pours it on his head, and he uh, kissed him and said, Has not the Lord anointed you a ruler over his inheritance? And so Samuel is the one who pours the oil, but it is the Lord who is the one who anoints Saul. Look down to verse number 6. Uh, Samuel gives Saul some instructions to follow, which will affirm that God has anointed him as ruler. It says, Then the Spirit of the Lord will come upon you mightily, and you shall prophesy with them and be changed into another man. It shall be when these signs come to you, do for yourself what the occasion requires, for God is with you. And so we see that this is for affirmation that Saul knows that he's been anointed by the Lord. Look at verse number 10, where Saul carries out the instruction, and we read in the, in the last half of verse number 10 that the Spirit of God came, mightily, came upon him mightily so that he prophesied among them. And so what we have in this passage is a reminder that Saul had been anointed by the Lord. He was chosen as God's instrument to be the first king of Israel. And unlike the New Testament where we see the the role of the Holy Spirit is somewhat different, in the Old Testament we noted before 
that there were those, both believer and unbeliever, that God used for his purpose. And so this anointing, this, this, uh, this anointing that we see from the Lord is the, the Spirit of God coming upon an individual uh, like a king or a ruler, or even, uh, for example, with, with, we see in the book of Judges, uh, what's his name? I never will forget his name. What, what's, <laughs> Samson. Uh, we see Samson, that the Spirit comes upon him, and, 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 and that for a purpose, uh, God uh, pours out his Spirit, rushes mightily upon these individuals. And so in the Old Testament, we see that the Spirit comes upon these individuals, and they're anointed for a specific purpose. And Saul here was anointed for the purpose of being the ruler, the king over Israel. But Saul failed to obey the Lord. Saul was disobedient, and because of his disobedience, God rejects Saul. And as a result of that rejection, then comes, uh, then he, the, the Spirit of God departs from him. Notice, looking at verse number 14 and, and looking back at verse 13, is that the Spirit of the Lord is, uh, comes upon David and it's almost simultaneous that the Spirit of the Lord comes upon David as the Spirit of the Lord departs from Saul. I say simultaneous. We really don't know the timing. It could have been a period of time in between there. But the point is, is that David is anointed the new king, uh, even though he has not yet taken that role, and it will be some time before he does so. God's favor is upon David. And as a result of Saul's disobedience, the Spirit of the Lord departs. But just one other note I'll mention about this, that we did this last time in walking through this, is that while we see the Spirit coming upon individuals in the Old Testament, in the New Testament, we see that the believers are indwelt by the Holy Spirit. And that is, and specifically you would read in Ephesians chapter 1, now, you might read that later on where the, the Spirit, we are sealed with the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit of God until the day of redemption. And so the Spirit comes to indwell the believer. Uh, he lives within us. And I think this is different than what we see in the Old Testament. In fact, it really makes sense when we look at the ministry of Jesus and, and he's having this conversation with his disciples and he's telling them, preparing them that the Holy Spirit is going to come and that you're going to receive the Holy Spirit. Uh, he says to them that you're going to do greater things than, than I did. How, how is that? Because it is the work of the Spirit in his people. Which brings us to the next section. Having seen the Spirit of the Lord, we see a Spirit from the Lord who terrorizes Saul. And this gets really interesting. Because as we think about what James teaches us in chapter 1, about evil, uh, we know, in fact, just go ahead and turn there with me. James chapter 1, you need to see that just as a reminder. In James chapter 1, beginning in verse number 13, uh, the Scripture says, Let no one say when he is tempted... I am being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, and he himself does not tempt anyone. And so he makes it very clear that God is not the one who tempts us. He's not the author of evil. He's not one who tempts us. And in fact, our temptation comes, as James continues in verse number 14, but each one is tempted when he is carried away and enticed by his own lust. It's been popular to say that the devil made me do this, or you know, this is because of Satan. But James makes it very clear that our sin is because of our own lust. We, we are drawn away. We are responsible and accountable for our sin. And it makes sense if you think about it logically. Uh, when you think about your sin, um, 
we, we enjoy sin, right? Uh, for for the moment, we enjoy it for the moment. Y'all, y'all looking at me all spiritual. Yeah, come on now. I mean, if 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 sin wasn't something that was enjoyable or pleasurable, we wouldn't do it because we we know it's offensive to God. But we we. We enjoy our sin. We have pleasure in our sin. The problem is, is that it's an empty promise. It, a sin promises us something, uh, and, and it's, and it's uh, a temporal, but the reality is, is that it doesn't last. And as believers in Christ, we cannot enjoy our state of sin. We just don't do that. And we become miserable because we know that we're a new person in Christ. We're created different. We're not supposed to sin. And we know it displeases God. One of the questions that you might ask of yourself in assessing your spiritual condition is how do you feel about your sin? Are you enjoying your sin? I didn't say that sin was not enjoyable. It is enjoyable, but it's for a season. It's temporal. But if you're enjoying living in your sin, something is spiritually wrong with you. If you have pleasure in uh, pursuing the things of this world, and it does not bother you that it is offensive to God, or it does not bother you or convict you that something is wrong with you spiritually, then you, you, you have reason to be of great concern this morning. Still haven't answered the question. But let's go back to where this spirit is. How are we to understand this spirit? Uh, first of all, I, I would just mention, looking at the, the passage in James, that we understand that, that God is not the author of evil, and, and so he's not the one who tempts us. So how are we to understand what's taking place here? I, I think there's another passage that might shed a little bit of light before I actually break down what's going on here. First Kings, I think, would be helpful. First Kings chapter 22. And while you're turning there, I, I will mention this. I said I wasn't going to break down the passage. I will mention this, that as I was looking at this passage in the original language, in the Hebrew, is that the word spirit, where we see in, in the first part of the verse, the spirit of the Lord, is the same word, where we see spirit from the Lord. What are we to do with that? Well, I'll come back to it in a moment. But I want you to look at 1 Kings chapter 22 and verse number 19. 1 Kings chapter 22 and verse number 19. And this is God through through his prophet, is pronouncing judgment on the wicked king Ahab. He says, therefore, hear the word of the Lord. I, I saw the Lord sitting on his throne. And all the host of heaven standing by him on his right hand and on his left. And look at this question. The Lord said, who will entice Ahab to go up and fall at Ramoth Gilead? And one said this... Well, another said that. Who, who is this that's saying this? It's the host of heaven. Who are the host of heaven? Angels. Then a spirit came forward, verse 21, and stood before the Lord and said, I will entice him. Spirit, same word, spirit. And the Lord said to him, how? And he said, I will go out and be a deceiving spirit in the mouth of all his prophets. Then he said, you are to entice him and also prevail. Go and do so. Now, therefore, behold, the Lord has put a deceiving spirit in the mouth of all your prophets, and the Lord has proclaimed disaster against you. What's going on in this passage is because of Ahab's rebellion and unfaithfulness, God uses this spirit to deceive him through False prophets. And do you see that? Who is this spirit? He's among uh, that host of heaven. I would argue, and, and we're not going to spend a lot of time here doing so, uh, 
But I would argue that this is a, a good angel. We could make a case that it is an evil angel, but I think because he's a, a member of the host of heaven, that it is a good angel carrying out God's work. Whatever it be, good angel or evil angel, they are at uh, the beckoning call of God. God is sovereign over this angel and using it to accomplish his purpose. I, I would say that it's probably a good angel because uh, it doesn't uh, refer to him as uh, a word that we would use for a demon. Although when you look at the Old Testament and the Hebrew language, there's a lot of, there's a lot of teaching on angelology, but not much on demonology. So we see evil spirits, but, but most of what we see in the Old Testament has to do with angels. I don't want to make this more confusing than I'm attempting to do at this moment, but simply to say this, that this is a spirit that God is using kings. Uh, and in this case, to, to, through the prophets in Second Kings, uh, a deceiving spirit uh, in judgment with Ahab. But looking back at 1 Samuel, in chapter 16, the spirit that he's using, he's using and he's sending this to Saul. And what's the spirit there? Why is he there? What, what is he doing? I think the word evil spirit gives us a, a little bit of uh, uh, hesitation because we just talked about that a moment ago, that God is not the author of evil, and so why would God be sending an evil spirit? But I don't think that evil refers to the morality of the spirit, but rather it, it speaks of the activity that he's doing. That is to say that he is uh, terrorizing uh, this, this uh, Saul. He is, he is uh, um, in one way we may translate this, that he is a, that this spirit is uh, evil or, or that he is, I'm at a loss for words here. I don't think evil is the best translation. To, to refer to that, although most of our translations refer to it as evil. But rather, in other words, when you see evil, it makes you think of this being an evil spirit, but I think it's more about the activity of what he's doing as opposed to the morality of him. That's what I... So, so in other words, it might be translated as distressing spirit. Troubling spirit. The question comes then, why is it, why is it that God would send this spirit to Saul? And I think the reason that we see is that the spirit has departed from Saul, but I would say that the reason that he has, that God has sent him, although it's not explicit, it, 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 it certainly implied that that because Saul is not repentant, that God is doing this as an act of judgment upon Saul. Now just think about that for a moment. Think with me for a moment. Stay with me. Saul, who's chosen by God to be his king. Saul, who started off uh, very well. And now Saul moves to a place where he's disobedient. He's disobeyed the Lord on a couple of occasions. And he refuses to own up to his sin. And so now God has rejected him as the king of Israel. He's torn the kingdom from him. No longer are his descendants going to be kings. He's going to give it to another, to David and his lineage. Saul, who has not repented, is being judged by the Lord. And God sends a spirit to Saul to terrorize him. Why? Because he did not repent. Do you hear that? 
it's judgment. Because he did not repent. So, so God sends this spirit to, to terrorize him. And, and notice Saul's response. And first of all, notice the response of the servants in verse number 15. The servants then said to him, Behold now, an evil spirit from that God is terrorizing you. They recognize immediately that Saul is being terrorized, probably in his language, probably the way that uh, he's telling them the way that he feels. Pro- pro- we, we're not told all the details, but, but they recognize immediately that something is wrong with Saul. Uh, why is it that they see this as the origin that it is from God? Well, because uh, the Hebrews, and, 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 and if we had a better theology and understanding of this, we would know that God is sovereign over everything. And so whatever happens is from God. It is God who allows it. It comes forth from his hand, whatever takes place. Uh, Job certainly knew this. Shall we receive good and not evil from the Lord? He wasn't attributing evil to God, but he's saying God is sovereign. God is the one who is in control. And there is nothing that happens that happens apart from his sovereign will. To paraphrase R.C. Sproul, if there's even one molecule, if there's even one molecule that that is is running um, contrary to to God's will, then God is not sovereign. There's nothing. There's God's in control over it all. You say, what, what about the murders? What about, what about the rapes? What, what about all of these things? God is sovereign, and, and there is purpose and design and all of that. Man is responsible for his actions. But God uses all things, even evil things, to accomplish his purposes. Just look at the brothers of Joseph. What? You meant for evil, Joseph said to his brothers. God meant for good. How can that happen? Because God is sovereign over the affairs of man. And so they recognize that that it's from God. And they, they provide a solution to Saul. They said, let our Lord now command your servants who are before you. Let them seek a man who is a skillful, skillful player on the harp. And it shall come about when the evil spirit from God is on you that he shall play the harp with his harp and you will be well. Uh, They understood that there is something to do with music that would comfort him. Now, now whether it is that the the music from the Lord would cause the spirit to go away or whether it was that Saul was comforted by the music so that the spirit did not bother him, I think it's probably the latter, probably the first, I should say, because we see that that the Spirit does leave when David comes and plays. Notice what Saul says. He says to his servants, provide for me. That phrase is loaded because the first half of this passage, there has been provided through David a new king. Provide for me now a man who can play well and bring him to me. Then one of the young men said, Behold, I have seen a son of Jesse, the Bethlehemite, who is a skillful musician. Just read that again. Provide for me a man who can play for me. And it's like one of the guys said, You know, you know this kind of, that reminds me of David. It reminds me of this... This kid who's out in the field tending sheep, where does that thought come from? (laughs) How is it that providentially he knew about David? We see those kind of things throughout the Scriptures. God, It's providence entering into the story. Oh yeah, David, a skillful musician, a mighty man of valor a warrior, one prudent in speech, and a handsome man, and and the Lord is with him. We'll we'll talk more about these as we go forward. 
in the weeks ahead, but just noted that, that they recognize that the Lord is with David. And so Saul sends messengers. And Jesse sends a, a gift with his son. And he comes back loaded with bread and a jug of wine and a, and a young goat. And notice what it says about David. It says that David came to Saul and attended him. Saul sends for David. David comes and attends him. And Saul loved him greatly. And he became his armor bearer. It, interesting that Saul loved him greatly. That's going to change as the story goes forward. But at this point in the story, uh, he's being ministered to by David. And he, he, he has this love for him, this affection for him, so much that he makes him his armor bearer, which will play out in the next chapter. And then he sends to, to Jesse, Let now David stand before me, for he has found favor in my sight. God has providentially orchestrated that David would now come and be a member of the court. Now, I don't think he's yet a permanent member of the court. We'll see that going forward. But it seems like that he's going back and forth. That he goes back home, but there are times where he comes, and he uh, probably when Saul is having these episodes where he calls for him, that David comes. And he's able to stand before him. Verse 23, so it came about whenever the evil spirit from God came to Saul, David would take the harp and play it with his hand, and Saul would be refreshed and be well, and the evil spirit would depart from him. I almost took a different direction in this because there's much that could be said about the ministry of music and, and how God uses music. I, I, I think. Music points to the fact that there is a creator, and God has gifted us with music. Just think about that for a moment, how, how music has an effect on our hearts, on our, on our souls, on our being. Just arrange notes. How is that? I think it points to our creator. But what I want to emphasize and close with is this is that Saul's remedy for this tormented, this coming from this spirit, Saul's remedy is somewhat superficial. Although he is ministered to by the music, he is still not dealing with the problem, which is his disobedience before God. Some years ago, I was... In the parking lot, my wife was, had gone into a store, and I was waiting patiently in the car as she was in the store. Can I get a witness? <laughs> she, she's, she's in there, and I'm the radio. And I cut on the radio, turned the car on so I could listen. And, and it wasn't audible, but, I, but it was almost as if I could just sense the Lord saying to me in my spirit, why is it that I need to be distracted rather than taking this moment and just being alone with the Lord? God wants us to spend time with Him which is the most incomprehensible thing that we can talk about. The God of the universe, the God who created all the... I mean, God wants to spend time with us. It, it, it's just so hard to understand or even to explain. The problem is, is that we've got so many distractions that are going on, and music is one of those, television is one of those. Whatever you want to plug into that, that, that we, these things become distractions and these things take us away from hearing what the Lord may be saying to us in our spirit and even through our conscience. In other words, let me ask you this. When was the last time that you just sat before the Lord and listened? 
not, not just come and, and pray, but come and listen. What, what is it that the Lord is saying to you? What, what, what is He saying to your heart? We're, we're quick to offer up our requests, but we're not as quick to listen to what it is that the Spirit is saying to us. In, in this case of Saul, superficially, he dealt with this terrorizing, this torment through music. And God uses music to minister to us. But the heart of the problem had not been dealt with. There's a judgment that's taking place. I, I, want to, I don't do this often, but I, I want us to turn to 2 Thessalonians for a moment. I want to close with a different passage. I don't do this. But I think it will bring home this point of judgment that we see in the passage that is before us. Never like to introduce a new passage at the end. But I just want to highlight one verse. And in chapter 2 of Second Thessalonians, if you're familiar with that passage, it's dealing with the man of lawlessness. I, I'm going to just leave out Ace, and I just the context of when this is or has taken place, and I just want to deal with what's going on in this passage. And, and what we see is going on is that, that there's this deception, just like we see in Second Kings, that there's deception that is taking place. There, there are those, and look at the end of verse number 10, or look at verse 10. And with all the deception of wickedness for those who perish, it says, because, these people, because they did not receive the love of the truth so as to be saved. In other words, what the first part of this passage is dealing with is this man of lawlessness, lawlessness is deceiving them, and they are deceived because they did not receive the love of the truth so as to be saved. In other words, because they had rejected the gospel, because they had not been saved, because of that, they are being deceived. Now look at verse 11, and just look at this verse in the context of what we've been reading. For this reason, God will send upon them a deluding influence so that they will believe what is false, in order that they all may be judged who did not believe the truth, but took pleasure in wickedness. Saul had failed to believe. He had failed to trust God. He had failed to repent. And because of this, God judged him. How did God judge him? He sent a spirit to torment him. How does Saul deal with it? Superficially. What's going on here in Thessalonians? There are those, and specifically Jews, who did not believe. They failed to believe the gospel, the truth that Jesus Christ came as, uh, to, to be an atonement for our sins, to, to make sacrifice on our behalf. They failed to believe the good news of the gospel. And because of that, when this man of lawlessness was teaching, as some refer to him as the Antichrist, John makes it clear that there are many Antichrists in the world. Antichrist is those who are in opposition of Christ or in place of Christ. This man of lawlessness who is speaking this deception, they believe that. Why? Because they had failed to believe the gospel. And listen to me now. I'm, I'm going to close with this. Sometimes we think about false teachers, and we think about what's going on in the world, and, and, and we think about the enemy coming against us, and, and it's a scary thing to know that there are those out there teaching things that are deceptive. But how much more fearful is it that God himself would send a deluding influence so that they would believe what is false? You think it's bad that the enemy is against us? What about when God is working with the enemy to make sure that you don't come to faith? Why? Because you fail to 
believe. And some of you are here today and you've had opportunity after opportunity to believe by faith and trust Christ in the gospel. And you think maybe one day I will do that right now. I'm just going to enjoy my sin. I'm just going to live my life. Let me say this. Do not harden your hearts that if the Lord is speaking to you today, that if the Spirit of, of Christ is drawing you, that God is drawing you through His Spirit unto Himself, then believe by faith in Christ. It's a scary thing to fall in the hands of the living God. It's a scary thing to, to be in judgment. It's a scary thing to be outside of Christ. You don't have the promise that when you walk out this door, that you will have another breath. And if you are a believer, and you do belong to Christ, then you ought to thank God that by His grace, He has caused you to believe. He has opened up your eyes, opened up your heart, that you might receive the truth. And be reminded that just as God was gracious to you, that if you are in this state of being unrepentant, that God will judge you. Why? Because He loves you too much to leave you miserable like you are. And if you're in sin, you are miserable. Are you here on purpose this morning? I, I believe so. Does everything happen for a reason? I believe so. And the Scripture teaches that God sent His Son on purpose to be a substitutionary atonement for our sin. God's Son died on the cross on purpose. He was raised from the dead on purpose. And then His Spirit draws us unto Himself to believe the gospel on purpose. Will you stand with me this morning? I hope that you understand that you are here on purpose and for purpose. And that purpose is to bring glory and honor to God. If there's a question about that in your own life, about whether or not you truly belong to the Lord, I will be available after the service. Be glad to talk to you about that, how you can know for certain. And to the believer, I would say this. When it comes to sin, keep a short, short list. As quick as you can, repent and turn from your sin. As soon as he reveals it. I'm going to pray. As I pray, I'll ask our deacons and wives to come forward. If there's something we can pray with you about this morning, you come. Father, as we have taken the time to examine this passage, we're reminded about the seriousness of disobedience and judgment. And I pray, Lord, for each of us today that we are in right fellowship with you. And if there be any in here this morning, Lord, who is outside of your will, oh God, by your grace, would you make it known to them their spiritual condition. Grant them repentance that they might, by faith, trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. It's in his name we pray. Amen.